afternoon. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Not yet. Hello. Hello. Is that better? A little more amplification. Can you hear me okay in the back? Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Steve Poisoner. I'm California Insurance Commissioner. And it's uh, uh, my privilege to be hosting this uh, forum tonight on insurance issues. I'll have a, a, a more to say about this in a moment, but uh, it's my pleasure to uh, turn this over to uh, your city council here to get this uh, event started off tonight. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Salazar. I'm on the city of San Bruno City Council. And so on behalf of the city and the mayor and the rest of the council, I'd like to welcome all of you uh, here tonight. I know uh, a lot of us would uh, love to be watching a very exciting game two of the World Series, and so I appreciate you making time to be here, uh, to, uh, especially to uh, our, our uh, representatives from the insurance companies, and uh, of course the residents and uh, all the other uh, officials who made time to be here today. And I especially want to uh, thank Commissioner Poisoner for setting this up. Uh, I think this is a very important event for, for the people uh, that were affected by this disaster and uh, we certainly appreciate you taking the time uh, and uh, really uh, paying attention to, to us here in San Bruno. So thank you for uh, setting up the event and uh, welcome. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure for my team and I to be here in San Bruno. I live in Los Gatos, just a few miles away. So uh, first of all, um, just a show of hands, how many people suffered some damage here in this explosion and fire? Well, first of all, I just want you to know that um, our thoughts and prayers from the, my team and I at the Department of Insurance for the, the suffering you've had to go through, uh, I know it's just a terrible tragedy. Uh, I've, I was elected insurance commissioner four years ago, and, and since I've been insurance commissioner, there's been one disaster after another in terms of wildfires. In the last four years, there's been over 4,000 people who've lost their homes completely in one type of disaster or wildfire in the state of California just in the last few years. So unfortunately, uh, my team and I at the Department of Insurance, we have a lot of experience at helping people rebuild their lives. And I know that the, the odds seem insurmountable when you've lost you know, your home or major damage to your home or God forbid if, you, if you've, you've lost a family member, I think this is just a terrible tragedy. But I've, I've seen this over and over again too in other parts of the state. People do rebuild their lives, it is possible. And, and we are here to help today mainly focused tonight on insurance issues. Now there's a lot of issues facing this community. The, fo the focus, the main purpose of this town hall this evening is to focus on insurance issues. And what's the major insurance issue here that we care about the most of the Department of Insurance is making sure your insurance company pays up completely and on time. Because that makes a world of difference in terms of helping you begin to rebuild your lives as quickly as possible. And that's, that's our goal in the next few days, few months, and however long it takes to make sure you know, all the, your, of the responsibilities from the insurance company gets fulfilled you know, for all the people here in, in San Bruno. Now, we have a large department of insurance. I have offices spread around the state of California. I brought with me tonight some experts from the department of insurance who, 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 who specialize in helping people you know, go through the rebuilding process, go through the process of getting your, your claims paid by the insurance industry. I also have 200 police officers that work for me in the Department of Insurance in my fraud unit. I just want you to know this, it's like clockwork. Every time there's a disaster, these scam artists show up. I'm telling you, you'll have it here. Be on the lookout. People pretending to be claims adjusters, people pretending to be contractors or unlicensed contractors, and we're gonna be doing undercover work here in conjunction with uh, law enforcement officials and we're gonna, we're gonna nip it in the bud. And, we're, and just like we've done in other areas, we'll make some quick arrests if needed in order to keep you from being victimized again. Now, uh, in order to make this session tonight as productive as possible, uh, I've asked people from the insurance industry and from some consumer groups to come here tonight so that you can begin to meet uh, some people who can help solve some of your problems. Now, we're gonna provide you some information this evening because we know there's some basic information we need to get out there that'll help you start the process of filing for claims and getting paid. But the main purpose of this evening is to answer your questions. So we're gonna have a Q&A session after the panel has an opportunity to speak. Ask any kind of question you want on any subject. For example, if you have a question about a particular insurance company, ask it and name names. Because at these sessions, we're gonna to try to solve problems tonight. If there are problems with a particular company, 
lay it out. And I'll, I'll put you in touch with uh, some representatives from the insurance companies who have come here this evening. We'll try to solve problems this evening directly. But some of you might not want to ask a question in this particular setting, or maybe your questions might come up later, tomorrow, or in the next week, or the next month. We've set up a hotline, so please write down this number. And tonight you'll hear from speakers from some of the other government agencies. Call us, no matter what your question is, just call us and we'll get you to the right place. But our hotline number is 1-800-927-HELP. 1-800-927-HELP. This number is also written on the literature that we're passing out in the back too, but that's our hotline number. Call us about any problem with insurance. Call us. Or you can contact us online at insurance.ca.gov. Uh, and in addition to that, if you want to meet with us one-on-one -on -one in person rather than over the phone or over the web, just let us know. We'll come back to your community as many times as we need to with my experts you know, to help you through the process of getting completely paid off by the insurance companies that, that owe you money based on the policies that you've, you've purchased and been paying for over many, many years. Now, before I go on, there's one group of people I do want to thank, uh, heroes. You know, there are 400 first responders, police officers, firefighters that came zooming in here and did a tremendous job in, in, in really risking their lives to, to respond to this disaster. Are, are any of them here? Is any firefighters or police here this evening? Well, can we give them a huge round of applause and hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll hear our thanks. Okay, so let me introduce some of the people that are here this evening in case you want to pigeonhole them afterwards with a question or you want to ask them a question in the Q&A session, but I know there's some other elected officials here. Uh, if there's other elected officials here, please stand up and introduce yourself. I'm any, any other elected officials? Okay, now I know there's some representatives of elected officials. Uh, please uh, stand up if you're representing an, an elected official and introduce yourself. And um, I, I know we have some officials here from San Bruno uh, and on the city managers here. Could you stand up and introduce yourself and any, any of your San Bruno staff that people should know about? Very good. Any other representatives of elected officials that would like to introduce themselves? Okay, uh, the in insurance companies, uh, I know you're here someplace. So if you represent an insurance company, uh, we don't need to meet every single one of you, but it just, let's, let's just identify which insurance companies are here this evening. Yes? AAA of Northern California. AAA. Uh, State Farm. State Farm. Allstate. Allstate. Travelers. Travelers. Any other insurance companies? Any representatives from uh, insurance trade groups? Uh, consumer groups, I know Amy, oh, I'm sorry, your? Insurance Information Network. Insurance Information Network, thank you, yes. I represent Liberty Mutual Group and Safeco. Very good, thank you. Sorry I didn't look on this side of the room. Uh, it seems like all, all of the insurance folks were kind of huddling in one part of the room there. <laughs> yes, sir. Farmers Insurance North California. Farmers, good, great. Any other insurance people? Okay, uh, consumer groups. I know Amy, we're here, Amy, Amy Bach. Uh, talk about your group for a moment, please. Hi, um, some of you may have already been in touch with us. I represent United Policyholders. We're a, a nonprofit organization. We happen to be based here in the Bay Area. And our uh, goal is to help solve insurance problems and be a health resource. So if you haven't already checked out our website, we have a special section of information for your community. We've been posting uh, the special rules that Commissioner Poisoner um, negotiated that help you get advances on your insurance. We've been posting documents from the city and we're posting information from our organization that will help you troubleshoot any insurance issues. And I just really want to thank the commissioner and his staff um, for being here. Um, and, and they've been very much on the ground from day one. And um, you'll introduce Tony Signorelli, from the beginning, he's been um, a real asset to the community in 
communicating with your insurance companies, uh, making sure that they were geared up to handle all of your issues, and then also keeping us in the loop and working with our organization. And then we'll be offering an event in, um, on the 15th, we've moved it to accommodate us to be counseling in the next week, um, where we'll be following up on this event to give some more hands-on troubleshooting help on if you have repair estimates that aren't jiving with what the insurance companies are saying, or if you're having issues with contractors, we're going to offer a workshop to follow up. So thanks again. So your website again, Amy? It's, uh, <laughs> which I didn't actually say. <laughs> so our website is uphelp.org. So it's uphelp.org. So, so just to help you put this in perspective, there's uh, Amy uh, represents a consumer group. It's a nonprofit. Uh, they don't have any particular axe to grind. They're, they're, it's a group that, that focuses on helping victims of natural disasters deal with insurance companies. It's a free resource. If you deal with, with uh, folks from these consumer groups, they're there to help you, you know, get some information and help you plot out strategies if needed. Of course, the Department of Insurance, if you contact us, it doesn't cost you anything, anything to contact, contact us at the Department of Insurance. It, the only way we can officially help you with an insurance company, though, is you have to file a complaint at the Department of Insurance. If you don't file a complaint, we can't help you officially, so you need to file a complaint. <coughs> if you do file a complaint, you don't lose any of your legal rights. You know, ultimately, you can always hire a lawyer and sue. I mean, that's always a, a, the, a right that people have. Thank goodness, it's sometimes something you have to do. But you'll hear from us this evening, there's a lot of other things you can do before getting that point. The lawsuit is like your last resort. It takes a long time, it's expensive, it's risky. You can always do it, but you should try to work through the other means of settling with your insurance company first, like talking to the insurance company. It often, most of the claims get settled just fine. If that doesn't work, you file a complaint, then Tony and his, his enforcers can, can, can help solve problems. If that doesn't work, there's mediation that the insurance companies have to pay for by California law. And if that doesn't work, you, know, you can talk to consumer groups for help. And if that doesn't work, you can always hire a lawyer and sue. So you got lots of options, and we're here to educate you on your options this evening. Now, uh, is, we have a panel. Did, did we cover all the introductions? Did, did we cover all the groups? Yeah? OK, so we have a panel this evening that's going to speak pretty briefly about certain things you just need to know. And then we'll get into Q&A. And uh, we'll, we'll stop the, the formal Q&A at a certain point just to try to keep this on schedule. But we'll stay here till as long as you have questions and talk to you all one-on-one -on -one if necessary tonight, tomorrow, or any time in the future. So let's, let's get on with the panel. Uh, let's, uh, let's start. Tony's going to be the last speaker. Ben, uh, introduce yourself and t tell us how the, the, the Small Business Administration can help out here. Thank you, Commissioner. My name is Ben Raju. I'm a public information officer with the U.S. Small Business Administration. What we do is offer low interest disaster loans at, to homeowners, renters, as well as small businesses and nonprofit organizations impacted by, by a disaster under declared disasters. Uh, earlier today, we received a request from the governor's office to, um, de uh, to uh, declare the area a disaster area, and we are currently looking into that request, and we'll be expediting that as quickly as possible to, uh, to move forward. Does that have to happen? Ben, first before you can actually start making uh, loans? Y yes, sir. Um, the, once the declaration is made, there will be people on site to uh, move forward and be able to uh, assist as quickly as possible. What's the timing of that decision? Uh, we're working on it. We received the request earlier today, and we're working on it to get it done as quickly as possible. Uh, and if, if it's declared a disaster, can, can you describe the size of the loan and the interest rates, that kind of thing? What SBA has to offer for homeowners and renters uh, for loss of personal property that is uninsured or underinsured uh, or uncompensated for by other sources, um, then SBA has up to $40,000 available at a low interest rate, which is typically under 3%. Um, and the, for homeowners that lost uh, um, uh, real estate, uh, real estate damages that were uncompensated for uh, by other sources, SBA has up to $200,000 available to help cover any of those losses that weren't covered by insurance companies or um, by private parties. The SBA's programs are available for businesses um, to assist with up to $2 million and um, uncompensated for losses as well. The 
the funds that SBA has available can be used to help cover the gap. Um, between what insurance may cover or and what um, the actual cost may be. Um, we talked a little bit, uh, or it was mentioned earlier, about uh, verifications and um, uh, loss adjustments and, and whatnot. SBA, when uh, somebody does apply for a loan, SBA does send out uh, independent loss verifiers to help you um, with the assessments of your damage as well. And um, as our other government programs, as the uh, Commissioner pointed out, there is no cost for any of these services. Um, if a disaster declaration is made and SBA does become available, none of these, uh, there is no charge for these services. Um, and we'll be happy to meet with folks and we will have folks with similar looking attire um, here in your community ready to assist. Okay, Ben, thank you. Now, you, you say you just got the formal request today. Yes, sir. I'm surprised it took so long to get that request in, but, but can you give some scope to how long will it take? Um, I mean, are we talking in a few weeks or a few days, or I just, just want to understand? We, uh, uh, I, if I, I was venture to guess, which it would uh, purely be a guess, I, I would expect that it would be within a few days. Okay, and you'll let the San Bruno officials know? Absolutely. We're okay, in close great. communication with our resources okay. out at the, uh, out at the state, um, and um, we'll be communicating directly with them. Okay, very good. Um, with, uh, um, with our folks and be able to uh, make sure that everybody's in the loop on on what's been going yeah, on. Yeah, it's a good time to, to introduce Tom. Go ahead, Tom. Exactly. And, uh, you're from the state of California. Give us an update, please. Good evening. I'm Tom Ariama. I, like the uh, commissioner, live right down the road in Redwood City. So uh, I was here very early on in this. I'm responsible for mutual aid for law enforcement, fire, and uh, I'm responsible for recovery. So I've been here 30 minutes into the incident and been uh, engaged with my staff, with the, the tremendous staff here at San Bruno. Uh, one thing I would ask you to note is with SBA. SBA was here on the ground with us very early on uh, doing a preliminary damage assessment. Uh, SBA did that, um, and when we requested a presidential declaration, they had to stop their process. Uh, that, that is something that is required uh, with SBA and FEMA, um, so they don't have to come in to do the preliminary damage assessment. It is done. So that package, uh, as I've spoken to the regional director, uh, is ready to be forwarded to, um, to Washington um, for review, uh, but it doesn't have to start all over. So it, it's ready to go out. All they needed was the formal uh, request from us. Uh, and the reason is, is that today, this afternoon, uh, we received information from FEMA that the appeal for a presidential declaration uh, has been denied. So um, we only have one appeal. The appeal was denied. Uh, and I will basically tell you the reason it was denied was that uh, FEMA believes that it is not beyond the capability of the local and the responsible party. So that's what it was denied on. So there. So, so that means uh, there may not be FEMA money here, but then that frees up the SBA to, to move more quickly. Is that fair Correct. to say? Correct. And that's what we were waiting for. We had to wait for that denial to come. And as soon as we got that, we transmitted it over to SBA so they can start on their process. Okay. Anything else, Tom, for the, for yeah. the moment here? One other thing. Um, we're working diligently with the County of San Mateo and the City of San Bruno um, on the preliminary damage assessments and writing the damage survey reports for all of the public infrastructure. Because until we get the public infrastructure done, uh, it's going to be difficult in some areas to, to undertake uh, the, uh, the rebuilding process. So we're trying to expedite that as quickly as we can uh, with San Bruno and with the County of San Mateo. Thanks. And Rose, uh, tell us. Uh, Tell us what we need to know tonight about the, the contractor's board. All right. Well, I'm from the Contract to State License Board. I'm an investigator. I investigate consumer complaints against licensed contractors and unlicensed contractors. Um, unfortunately, there are people who uh, prey on disaster victims. And uh, unlicensed contractors uh, go to uh, disaster sites and take advantage of vulnerable homeowners. So we have posted uh, disaster uh, signs throughout the community here uh, to uh, make sure that the victims know their rights and also to notify the uh, scam artists that we are out there. Um, we want the homeowners to know 
that before you hire contractors, obtain two or three bids and check their license. The uh, contractors usually carry a pocket license. Ask to see that and ask for other identification. Uh, when you enter into a written contract, make sure that all of your uh, verbal agreements are all delineated within the written contract. Uh, make sure your uh, contract price is in, uh, in the contract, the uh, scope of the work, and um, also the payment schedule. Now, the uh, most important thing is there are scammers out there who try to um, get an excessive down payment. Then they um, take off without performing any work or very little work. So the law states that a home improvement contract uh, the payment should, down payment should not exceed 10% uh, of the contract price or $1,000, whichever is less. You want to make sure that your payment, uh, the contract contains a, a progressive payment schedule and do not allow your payments to exceed the value of the work performed. Check the contractor's license number. You can check them on our website and it's uh, www cslb.ca.gov and the Contractor State License Board has also set up a, uh, a hotline for disaster victims and the telephone number is 800-962-1125. So um, we have um, set a booth, a table out in the front and there are brochures, pamphlets that you can pick and there are detailed information about what you should have within your contract <coughs> and uh, the terms of the agreement. So uh, feel free to help uh, yourself and we'll be out there to answer any <coughs> questions that you may have and uh, contact us on our website and uh, contact us um, in our San Francisco office. Thanks, Rose. A uh, couple just really key things she said, uh, three bids. Uh, often working with local contractors can be a good option. You should look at any option you want, but sometimes local folks, you know, are your neighbors and all. Make sure you, you get multiple bids and compare and contrast. Make sure you do reference checks on any contractor you hire and, and call Rose uh, on her hotline uh, if you want to check to see if the contractor is licensed. You can, you can check to see if they're licensed in the state of California or not by checking their website or calling them on their hotline. Yes? Yes. Very good. That's correct. Thanks. Okay, uh, Tony has been with the Department of Insurance for, I keep asking, 18, 18 years. years. Uh, so, you know, we have about 1,000 employees all spread out throughout the Cal uh, California, as I mentioned. Uh, Tony runs uh, my consumer services market conduct group. So he's the one who audits insurance companies to make sure they're fulfilling all of their legal obligations. And he has a whole team of people that take phone calls uh, from the public. We get 300,000 a year. Uh, where people have questions or complaints about insurance companies, it's Tony and his team uh, that are the experts in making sure people are getting what they deserve from insurance companies. So Tony, a few suggestions for the folks here. Sure, thank you, Commissioner. Um, I want to leave a, as much time as possible for questions, so I just want to go through a couple of just kind of brief uh, issues or topics just to give uh, maybe people, uh, maybe it'll lead to a question that you might have or lead to a conversation later in, in, the, uh, in this forum. Uh, the first thing is, um, well, the first, let me, the very first thing is this is, this situation is a little bit different um, in that we have a PG&E uh, coming into the situation. But I'm only going to speak to mainly about the insurance aspect of it. There will be some nuance to the, nuances to that because of the PG&E issue. But let's first focus on what your insurance company's obligations are, and then we can go from there. Um, the, you know, the first issue, the first steps, you know, really are, and we're, we're several days in now, and I assume most of you have filed your claim. If you have not filed your claim, you really need to file your claim. There's really no reason, and we could talk about that if you have a question, um, to not file your claim. There, your claim could be uh, jeopardized down the road if you decide if you are a late filer or don't file after a certain periods of time. So please file your claim. The, the second issue is get a copy of your entire insurance policy, including your what's called your declarations page, which is your top sheet that says you have, you know, has your address, your policy limits, that sort of thing, your type of coverages. 
um, and then your entire policy, it may be 30, 40 pages long, and you don't necessarily have to know it and understand it completely, but you need to have it and refer to it because as you go through this claims process, you're going to be uh, in conversations with your insurance company where they're going to they're understand it, they're going to be experts in that contract, and they're going to be bringing issues up uh, or exclusions or various coverages, and you're going to want to refer back to that or at least be able to point to it and, and ask a question to either a department or, or someone that might be able to help you or walk you through that process. The insurance company has 30 days to give you a copy of that estimate once you make that request, so do so immediately if you haven't already uh, done so. Uh, third step really is to get organized. I know that's not easy, but uh, one, one thing would be to make sure you're saving all your receipts for everything you're doing. Um, you may not need them, and there may be some you know, flexibility with insurance companies on what they might uh, ask for, on, on whether it's your additional living expense coverages or your personal property losses or your emergency repairs or even your, your overall repairs or rebuilding. But, uh, you're better off saving everything you possibly can, and if you don't need it, great, but if you, if you do need it, at least you'll have it. So if you have to get a big box and start throwing things in it, that's probably a, a good first step. Additional living expenses is very important, obviously. Um, because this is a uh, declared uh, emergency, the insurance company is required, uh, regardless of what your policy uh, coverage, your time limit on your policy might be for additional living expenses, is required to give you 24 months of additional living expense coverage. It doesn't increase your coverage limit, so if you have $80,000 for additional living expenses, that'll still be your limit, but you'll at least be able to uh, use that through a 24-month period, even if your policy, for example, in a non-emergency situation might only cover you for 12 months. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, regarding your, uh, your contents, your personal property, it, it's going to be really important to keep receipts um, as you replace things. It's going to be, uh, you're, at some point, you're going to have to itemize um, whether your insurance company is going to be flexible in that regard in terms of uh, grouping certain items, you know, a hundred books versus naming every book or uh, your wardrobe, those sorts of things. Um, the Commissioner Poisoner was, was instrumental a few years ago in getting some voluntary claim reforms, which I think helped a, a lot. And, you know, one of those was the insurance companies were going to be more flexible in terms of w the, the strictness in the inventory that they would normally require you to do, which could be pages and pages long under, under, uh, in the past. Um, so hopefully that flexibility is still there. In addition to that, because this is a declared emergency, you know, voluntarily many, many of these companies has al have also agreed to pay an upfront advance money for additional living expenses, or I'm sorry, for contents. So um, you should be getting that from your insurance company if you suffered a total loss or a substantial loss. If, if you're not getting that up front or if you haven't already received it or, or you're not in conversation about it now, please contact us so we can you know, expedite that. The primary issue you're going to face is determining how much, is my, how much are the damages. What is my loss? How much is it going to cost to rebuild? How much is it going to cost to repair? Those are really going to, that's going to be the real key issue in your structural loss. And whether you have a total loss or whether you have a substantial loss or, or just a, a partial loss, let's say, for smoke damage, you're going to need to quantify what you, what you lost. For a total loss, you're going to need to uh, quantify what it would cost to rebuild that identical property. If it's a three-bedroom, two-bath, 2,000-square-foot home, that is what needs to be quantified so that the insurance company can determine the cost that it needs to pay for its replacement cost for the home. If it's a partial loss, you're going to need to determine with the, with the contractor's help or maybe other experts as to what needs to be done to, does the roof need to be repaired? Does it need to be completely replaced? Does it need to be completely repainted or partially? You know, those are going to be some of the issues. So you're going to need to work uh, with your insurance company and in getting their scope of loss dealt with to, to give them the information they might need 
to uh, so they can flesh out what what was there if it's a total loss uh, and understand what needs to get done as well as work with your contractor or others other experts so you can quantify your loss with the insurance company and that's going to be very important and and when you do or if you do run into an impasse or a roadblock we're definitely here to take a look at that issue resolve any disputes where we can and get the case back on track if it falls off track. In the end, if there's still a dispute as to um, the amount of money the insurance company's willing to pay or the, the scope of damages or disagreement as to what really needs to get done, is this really smoke damage or is it not, or is it prior damage or wear and tear, that sort of thing. Um, if we can't get it resolved at the Department of Insurance, we do have a, we have, we have a formal mediation process. We have about 100 mediators located throughout the state and many in this area that will, for free to the consumer, will attempt to mediate the case with the insurance company. And it's non-binding on either party, but it, we've had a pretty good success in getting the parties together to get uh, an agreement and a settlement. Um, so that's one avenue. Um, ultimately, you could there's an appraisal provision in your insurance policy and that's a more formal process that is binding. Um, that's not something that we deal with. That would be something that you would work with your insurance company on and, and uh, you might hire an adjuster in that case to, to work with you to quantify your loss. And at, at that point, a, an, ind an arbitrator uh, will, an appraiser will end up making a final binding decision on the cost of, of your claim, then the insurance company will pay that amount. Um, in the, you know, in the end, please contact us, even if it's a simple question or you're even just in the initial stages and you have a, maybe a small issue with the, uh, your personal property issue, get us in, you know, get into our system so that we can assign a, one of our experts uh, in our office that can contact you on a regular basis. And you can contact that person and bounce something off, you know, of them if you have a question. Um, because if you don't do that from the beginning, you're going to be starting from scratch maybe three, four, six months from now. Um, so get into our process. You know, we don't uh, deal with it when you come to us. It's not an adversarial thing where, you know, the insurance companies, um, you know, it shouldn't be an adversarial thing. The insurance companies are, are fine. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll speak for them on this. They're fine with uh, you contacting us and us contacting them trying to work this issue out because in, in many ways, um, you know, that could assist and getting some of these, these issues resolved. In the end, if, if we can't resolve it, and if it's something, let's say, beyond our authority or a legal issue, um, and the mediation doesn't resolve it, then as the commissioner suggested, um, there's always, you know, speaking to an, an attorney, seeing what, what can be done, speaking to the consumer group, see if they have uh, other resources or sources for you. Thanks, Tony. This is probably our 12th or 13th type of town hall we've done around the state after these unfortunate disasters. Just a quick question, how many of you don't have a copy of your insurance policy because it might have gotten damaged or destroyed? Okay, um, we get this question a lot, how can I get a copy of my insurance policy? Tony, can you a a answer that? Well, and first of all, if your company's here, I mean, let's get with them tonight and, and, and if you've requested it and hadn't received it or if you haven't requested it yet, make sure make their request tonight and we'll make sure that you get it because it's very important to have that. It's really your, you know, your, your roadmap to, to what your insurance company's obligation is. Of course, they're, they're obliged by law to give you a copy of your policy and within a certain number of days, so. 30 days. Yeah. Uh, pg and &E, are there folks from pg and &E here? Uh, could you, uh, I meant to introduce you all. Could you just stand up and introduce yourselves? Uh, the focus of this evening is not on PG&E issue, PG &E issues so much. You're going to have, a, I think, a, a seminar or town hall tomorrow night, which will focus more on PG&E issues. But you may have some questions about how the PG&E programs, how they interact with insurance programs. Those questions might come up tonight. That would be just fine. But can you introduce yourself so that folks know that you're here? My name is Ashley Simpson. I'm with PG&E Regulation. Mm -hmm. All right, very good. Um, in the future, when you introduce yourself, if you step to the microphone, please, that way you can record it for the TV stations and for the center of the TV stations. Okay, very good. Thanks, Thanks Byron. So if you have questions now, uh, please um, you know, come to the microphone and ask uh, on really any subject. Though the focus tonight is we're here to help you on insurance issues. That's the focus tonight where we have our team of insurance experts here, here in the back of the room. And I have a bunch of my lawyers from San Francisco here too and consumer services folks from Los Angeles. If you have questions, uh, 
please. Now's a good time. I know you've got some questions here. <laughs> Sir, please come, come to the microphone and ask us so everyone can hear. Thank you. Thank you for coming to the microphone. You're welcome. If you can uh, uh, just st state your name. That would my be name's great. Robert Sherlock, and my question is pretty simple, but it's important to me and my family. My house was 350 feet, according to Google Earth, from the um, blast crater, we'll call it. And my insurance company is Farmers. They've been pretty good about replacing stuff. But I have ran into some glitches. Like, for instance, we got three bids to replace our windows, and we have premium windows. And they offered us $4,000 initially. And that wouldn't even replace one of my sliders. So we had to go through somewhat of a uh, hassle to get them to kick down the money. That's fine. Then I see my neighbors are starting to get their roofs replaced. And they had a uh, roofer come out, examine, uh, the insurance company had a roofer come out on behalf of them, examine the roof about a week ago. And we haven't heard anything. It's like, they don't respond to us. We have to constantly call them to get answers. So I had a roofer come out and look, and he says, we need to get it replaced, okay? And my, my, my question basically is, why does it take so long for one insurance company to respond while another one's real quick? Because where I am, 3A is being great at replacing my neighbor's roofs, and more specifically, my neighbor next door, who's technically further away from the blast crater than my house, his roof's already been removed, replaced, and it's over and done with. My house is closer, but yet my insurance company seems to take a long time to get anything done. Okay, that's a really good question. Uh, so, Tony, first of all, can you just address the issue of what are the what are the consumer protection statutes in California? What are the requirements in terms of the insurance company responding in a certain amount of time to this whole process? Well, in, in general, they're required to respond within 15 days to every communication, you know, that that you make. And there's some there's some nuances of that, but you know. You should know. You should be hearing back from your insurance company, and you know, and that's one of the reasons why we're having this forum is to, to, to you know, if your company's here, which they are. Okay, you know, where, where's the farmers? To, okay. You know, to get with them, you know, and figure that out, and you know, make sure that the the estimate gets done from the insurance company's end, and that you examine it, and you're comfortable with it, and the decision that's being made going forward, you're comfortable with. Uh, in the end, uh, once you do get the insurance company's estimate. And in either the amount is not there, is not what you were, what you're either your contractor is suggesting it should be, or if the, the scope of what the insurance company is willing to replace is not the same as, let's say, a full replacement, if, if that's what your, what your claim is, then you need to, you're going to need to document that. You're going to need to get your estimate from your contractor so that, um, and then if you go to, go to the insurance company, provide that information to them or maybe have them talk to each other. That's probably the best thing. In the meantime, we're always there uh, available to intercede and look at it and say, okay, is the insurance company fulfilling its obligation in terms of paying the claim, planning to replace the, the damage that was caused by the fire? Okay, well, so, while, while I'm up here, then I'm on a roll. Specifically, then let me give you an example. The house that's next door to mine that's technically further away from the fire. They're in, they're, they're, my roof was put on brand new in 2002. My neighbor that had his replaced that is further away, his roof was newer than mine, and his has already been replaced. Now, let's assume that Farmers comes back and says, oh, no, your roof is fine. Then I'm curious, why does 3A come in and say a roof that's newer than mine needs to be replaced? Because I spoke to my neighbor about it. But yet, if, if, if Farmers comes in and says, oh, no, yours is fine, then why is it one insurance company says replace it and the other one says no? Well, well part of the difficulty there is there, there are two different roofs. Um, that's what I'm getting at, because yeah. the one that's been replaced is further well, away well, than mine. Well, so right, it seems since mine's closer, it would have suffered more heat well, damage. Well, you know, in theory, that's, 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 if that's the case, that's, then you have a very good, very good point. But we have to look at your particular roof. Does your particular roof, did it suffer damage such that it needs to be replaced or partially repaired? Um, so it's, it's very difficult to kind of look at other houses and say, well, this one was replaced, so mine should be. But you know, you know, you know more than I do. I haven't seen your roof, but we have to really look at your roof. Does your did your roof suffer damage such that it needs to be replaced? And that's the, the question that needs to be answered first. And the, the insurance company needs to make a decision, an initial decision. You need to be comfortable with that decision, 
and if not, you need to go back to the company and ultimately to us to see if we can uh, okay. resolve it. So that. He, here's, uh, what's your first name again? Robert Sherlock. Robert, so here are two suggestions. First of all, uh, get with that farmer's guy, you know, right now, to either either now or after the session's over. Uh, your name? <coughs> What, are you are you from claims side of the house? I'm sorry. What what part of farmers? The claims processing? Yeah, okay. Get with him tonight, and and uh, can you work to see to, to, if you can work to speed up the process of uh, getting his claims paid? It, it, the best solution is when the policyholder and the insurance company can just work it out by yes. having active communication. But if that doesn't work, call Tony. And, and we will um, make sure that they fulfill all their responsibilities. Okay. All right. Thank you very much Thank for you. your time. Thank you yeah, for thanks. coming tonight. Thank you. What else? Any other questions? Please. James Sorensen, I live on 1721 Earl. It was completely destroyed. I was three, three houses from the uh, site. I have a couple questions. One thing, we started out really good with farmers that the initial estimates and everything they came out with. Then they looked at the property and they said I was overinsured. So they want to cut my claims now by a third of what the initial estimates were because they said I had too much insurance on my house, which policies that they wrote, I didn't write them, I signed them, but I don't write them. And now they're saying everything should be cut by a third. Is there anything to do with overinsured things that can be resolved? Well, I mean, there, there really should not be an issue with you being overinsured. You, you entered into a contract for a policy limit. Right. Um, you know, they should stand by that. I mean, the, we'll need to, we would need to look and see whether the reason why they're cutting your claim by a third or a third of what, of what your claim is um, is because of your policy limit or because they just believe the overall cost to replace is less than what they originally wrote. They dis they this estimated the property when they wrote the property. Okay, that policy. that was not a, a sufficient reason. So obviously, we would want to know more. And, and so I can hold them to the initial estimate they gave me based on the policy, <laughs> as opposed to after they determine the estimates, it should be cut by a third. Well, in terms of holding them to it, I mean, y you should do that. You should certainly do that. So Whether I legally, I mean, we wouldn't be able to say okay. The insurance company must be held to that, but we'll certainly look at that. And if, if unless there's sure some extenuating of circumstances, if they wrote the estimate and the estimate was accurately reflecting what you what you lost, you know the size, the square, you know the square footage, the number of bedrooms, that's number the number of bathrooms. That's the problem. They did. The square footage was stated in my policy, and they overestimated the square footage by about a thousand feet. On the estimate or on the, on when, the you, when you bought the coverage? When you bought the coverage? Yeah. Yeah. They, that. that if they overestimated it when you bought the coverage, that shouldn't matter. If they overestimated it when they wrote their estimate originally and now are saying uh, when, after the, after the, no, it's the on loss. No, it's on the policy. It's overestimated right. on the policy. Okay. Yeah, th that shouldn't be an issue. If they overestimated on the estimate they wrote and now are saying we made a mistake when we did the estimate right. and now we need to correct that, that right. would be one thing. But the other way around, there shouldn't be any issues there. Okay, I didn't think so, but that's because I've been paying for it. <laughs> so. But we could figure that out. I mean... Okay, so, so James, I have the same uh, suggestions for you. Is talk, the farmer's person, can you? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I also want to say I have very good relationships with farmers. This is the only first hard time I've had. So Let me just uh, thank the farmer's person for coming this evening. Uh, please talk to him this evening. Okay. And then, and then, then um, I have one other yeah. question. Sure. They've also told me when we, we live in an earthquake zone. There's no additional expenses for living in an earthquake zone such as sheer walls, bolting houses down, bolting my chimney down so it doesn't fall down. And it says there's no cost involved in that. It, should be, it shouldn't be added to the estimates. Is it, and, I, and I went to the building department in San Bruno, and they said there's an issue, um, section issued by the state of California saying houses have to be up to these codes. But now they're saying those shouldn't be included in the estimate to build my new house because she'd never heard of anything as uh, well, earthquake. Well, we, we would have to look at two things. First, did you have building code, code upgrade coverage on your policy? Mm -hmm. uh, what the insurance company will do is they'll evaluate uh, the cost to replace exactly what you had, not considering code. No, it was, in the, it was in the house already. Oh, it was in the house already? I did it. Okay. Oh, you did it after? 
Uh, After 84, was it 84? When was it? 89 or whatever. 89. I did it all at that point. Okay, so it should it should be included as long as it was included in uh, the description of your property in, in general terms. It wasn't, in other words, if you added square footage, in your case it doesn't matter because you have more square footage right. apparently anyway, but, <laughs> uh, but it, it really, it, it shouldn't be an issue then, but you know, we, we don't have the facts to, right, to be I able know. to figure that out, but we'd, we'd be happy to take a look at it, and, and the farmers would be happy to take yeah. a look at it. Because it's been going pretty good until we got into these things and then the final yeah. things. Yeah, usually once you get down to the, you know, the, those last steps, usually. Then we have one other question. Sure. Is when, when they determine the uh, cost of repairs, <coughs> they're repairing on what they call a computer program for national average, not local average. So if you want to rebuild your house, it's not based on building a house here. It's built based on building a house anywhere in the United States. It, the, the, insu the insurance claims regulations require it to be the cost to build in the local area. Okay, so it is So it that. should be at least that amount. You know, assuming the national average is less than, <laughs> than this area, then th the insurance company should not be evaluating your loss based on a national average. So I can get them on, a, I can get them on that too, then, because that's not, that's not real, realistic, right? we would be happy to talk to them about that. Okay, thank you very much. Amy, do you want Amy, to come sure. up to the mic? So it, it sounds like uh, maybe you haven't gotten your own estimate for what, not yet. Okay, I think that will help, that will help very much because I think a lot of times your insurance company adjuster will take a sort of a first pass at estimating um, the replacement cost and maybe they'll use this program called Xactimate which spits out a pretty impressive looking um, computer generated estimate. But um, as we often say, computers don't build houses, um, you know, builders build houses. So you really are going to have to get your own um, independent estimates, uh, at least uh, as the commissioner suggested, it's, it's a good idea to get more than one. Um, and that does take a little bit of time. And one of the important but kind of difficult things to do is to get the estimate to replace the home that you had even if you have no intention of replacing that exact house. And it's very, in fact, it's very, very rare after a total loss or even a very serious loss that somebody wants to put back the exact same house. People always think, well, I could make, I, it could be a little better this way or that. But what your insurance company owes you is to put back what you had. And so you have to take that extra time and sometimes even expense to, to get to an apples to apples agreement with your insurance company and, and very often people will go off track in their in their discussions with their insurance company because they're just not talking about the same thing. Your insurance company is talking about replacing like kind of quality what you had, hopefully, and you're talking about what you want to do. So if you can get back to first go back a step, get get back to that hypothetical as if you were going to replace what you had try to come to an agreement with the insurance company and then figure out what kind of money you have available to do what you want. So that, that I think is a very crucial step. Thank you, Amy. Tony, yes sir, please. name's Jerry Guernsey. Uh, we lost everything, and I had a lot of collections. My insurance company, 3A, has told me I'm supposed to list everything, and I had a lot of tools. They're telling me they're going to devalue my tools no matter what condition they were in. Lifetime guarantee doesn't matter. And I've got 22 pages of stuff I've written up so far, and I'm wanting to know, number one, when do I have to file by? How many, how many days, months, or whatever do I have? And number two, do I have to be so specific to list every little wrench and screwdriver that I had? Uh, did, did you receive a, an advance payment on that yet? Uh, yes. Okay. The second so you, day they gave, okay, gave good. us so an you get, advance. So you received that. 
Um, we'd have to go to your specific insurance policy, but um, you know, you, you still have time. I mean, generally speaking, you have a year um, with, you know, that's not set in stone, but it's about a year. But um, obviously you wanna do it as soon as you can do it. Mm -hmm. And you're going to want to be as detailed as possible. And once the insurance, there's going to be two steps that in terms of devaluing, we'll have to see whether the insurance company is suggesting if you have replacement cost coverage on your content, your personal property, if they're, they could be depreciating it on the front end in terms of the initial payment to you and withholding that difference until you've actually replaced the item and then reimbursing you for that difference at the end of that process. Right, he's told me that. Right, so if, if that's the case, then you know, that's <coughs> valid and legal to do. Right. Um, if there's something else going on, then obviously we'd, we'd wanna know about that. There may be some issues with tools in terms of uh, what are called sublimits uh, on tools that, um, that would like, further reduce how much they might pay on uh, you know, various issues like tools, uh, mm -hmm. Automobile parts, uh, cash, jewelry, that sort of thing. There could be sublimits of a thousand dollars, or five hundred dollars, or two thousand dollars, depending on what your policy says. Right. So there are these those things to look at too, uh, in addition to the depreciation that they might be doing on the on the front end. But you you would in theory get that back once you spent the money to actually do the replacement. No, he's told me if I replace things, they'll pay it. The problem is we have no house. So I'm not gonna go out and buy a whole bunch of stuff to put in a rental house, and we probably won't have another home for a couple years. So, and I'm 67 years old. I don't necessarily wanna have 50 years of tools again. And plus, I lost a 57 Chevy that was my, right. my pride and joy, and I'm not gonna build another car. Right, and you, so work with your insurance company. I mean, you have time before you need to actually replace it. I mean, your policy will have the time limit on there. It's typically, uh, it'll say either 180 days or, you know, or 12 months or, or something. Yeah. And, and take a look at that. Um, you know, if, total, if that on, needs to be on a, a, on a total loss, though, is there? Is you should, I mean, the house won't be rebuilt, you know, in 180 days. So right. I mean, is there a certain number of days after the house gets rebuilt? Yeah, I mean, the insurance company and. Almost every case I've seen will work with you in terms of the time frames. If you're coming up on that, if the house isn't rebuilt yet, you know they can't expect you to buy it in order for you to uh, collect the additional money that that you would normally get. So, you know, hopefully we won't get to that point. But um, but I mean I'd say you know come in come into our process and let us at least you know answer some of the questions more specifically based on your exact case, your exact policy. Um, and then maybe walk you through any other issues that you might have too. Okay, thank you. And Jerry, uh, Tony mentioned that, that I, I was successful in negotiating with the insurance companies uh, a few years ago after those terrible 2007 fires to ease up when there's a total loss on, on uh, inventory requirements because gosh, it's practically impossible, right? So uh, AAA, or is there someone? Yeah, could you, could you get with this gentleman uh, afterwards and see if you can help him Simplify the inventory process. Thank you. Okay, next question. <coughs> yes, ma'am, please. I would like you to address um, the meaning of the privacy portion of your insurance policy not to be shared with other entities and what you do if that has been violated or prospectively violated. And then the other thing I'd like you to address is um, if you would give me a thorough explanation of what um, the living expenses per diem um, maximum would be if you were staying in a hotel or, and or eventually get into a rental home you want to start with the living expense question? Yeah, in terms of additional living expenses, you're going to have a, a policy limit. Right. Let's say it's $50,000. Um, and it may, there may even be a time limit. You know, some policies don't have a time limit. It could be to the, up until the point where you uh, can reasonably rebuild and move back in. Other ones will say uh, six months or 12 months or 24 months. Uh, because this is a, an emer a declared emergency, 
um, the law requires your additional living expense coverage to be 24 months. That doesn't increase your limit, but with that in mind, if, if let's say you have a 12-month policy and a $50,000 additional living expenses, you're now going to need to try and work to, to make that last not 12 months, but maybe 24 months <laughs> in, in your particular situation. How do you find out what the per diem limit is when they won't tell you on your policy? Well, the, there typically is not a per diem limit. It's okay. typically the reasonable expenses incurred, um, additional living expenses incurred to because you need to relocate and maybe you're traveling further or... or you so know. it basically would be your gas and any eating, any grocery bills or cleaning bills or wash, laundry all, bills? All, all of your bills... Um, Telephone bills? Yeah, well, what you would look at is what were your costs before? And then you would look at what are your costs now? So the additional amount, and, and then there's different, there's uh, <coughs> uniqueness depending on what your policy is. Um, the additional amount is typically what you're owed. Uh, not the full amount. If, you're, if you were spending, if your household was spending 2,000 a month and, and now you're spending 3,000 a month, then your additional living expenses would be a, a thousand a month in theory. Um, some policies uh, may opt, or you may have an option in some policies to go with what's called a fair renter value option, which is to just get um, uh, what would a, what would that what would your property rent for, um, and, and instead of going through the uh, cost incurred basis of every receipt and every meal and every. Uh, monthly hotel bills and everything, it would mainly be um, what is the fair rental value of your home, and that would be the amount that you that you could get. Not all policies have that, and, and, and sometimes it's not an option. See, in my case, I was only out of the property about three and a half weeks. And you're back in? To a month, yeah. Well, it, I mean, uh, assuming, you know, the, it, your situation's finite, it's, it's over, right? Now you're just right. looking at, here's the costs I incurred, and how much insurance company are you going to pay me for these incurred costs that I'm submitting? I, I assume, you know, work with your insurance company, but certainly come to us. We'll take a look at that and see what's what's fair and reasonable and what the insurance company's obligation is and what they should be paying you. Now, I know t Tony's mentioned this several times, you know, come ask us questions. The insurance policies are these legal documents that are complicated. So if you, if you send us a copy, we have teams of experts that know how to read these things and interpret them. If we get a copy of your insurance policy, we can help you understand, you know, what you're owed. Uh, but we need to see the actual policy to help there. With regards to the privacy question, do you know about that? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, in, in terms of the privacy issue, I mean, certainly if the, we would have to, we have to, we'd have to understand um, what information was being uh, transmitted and to whom and why um, and, and look at, you know, what your policy provisions are and look at the policy uh, statutes and the policy and the privacy statutes and the privacy regulations that we have in place and ensure that the insurance company is following that certainly well I was told and this could this is just hearsay but um, from a manager at ServPro um, that only farmers had that uh, this privacy thing that could be basically violated in their policies, but all the other insurance companies do not have that so that they can't violate your privacy um, as an insurance company by giving out any information about your claim to anybody. And so I'd just like generally for you to address that to the public. Here. Well, yeah, it really depends. I mean, they, they have a lot, of, they're able to provide information to um, Claims uh, clearinghouse, you know, data gatherers, that sort of thing. Um, they provide information to their adjusting staff and some outside adjusters and outside, you know, affiliated uh, service people that might be working on your case. Um, other than that, we'd, we'd really need, we'd need to know more information, but certainly if, if an insurance company is providing uh, personal or privileged sensitive information um, that they shouldn't be, and we would like to know about it so that we can, you know, do something about it, certainly. Adam, do you have anything to add on that? No. Okay. All right. Thank you for those questions. Any, any, any other questions? Any other questions for the group? Now, if you, you may prefer to ask these questions after we wind up this, this portion. If you prefer to ask questions one-on-one, -on -one, I'll introduce uh, my CDI team here in a moment. 
go up to any, any Department of Insurance person, see if you can get help too, or of course the insurance folks are gonna be sticking around. There are people you need to pigeonhole if you have some specific questions about that company. But any other questions uh, that you wanna ask uh, in front of the entire group here? Yes, ma'am, oh, please. Actually, there's some of us that wrote questions out before we came in, uh, because someone was gonna read them, so. Do we have those? <coughs> oh, these are the ones? Okay, well, uh, Tony will look over those, the written questions here. Does anybody else have any other question you want to come up to the mic and ask? Tony, do you want to look through the written questions? Yeah, let me look through them in a second. Um, I'll bring up another issue that I, that I just wanted to make sure you know, people are aware of. Um, two issues mainly. Um, especially, you know, in the case where you've uh, suffered a total loss, certainly, um, you're eligible if you have a replacement cost policy which most of you most likely do you're eligible for the full replacement cost of of the structure the cost to replace that structure now you're eligible for that whether you replace that home in the same location or whether you replace that in another location whether you rebuild in another location or whether you go and buy a, a resale property in another location you're still eligible for up to the full replacement cost of your policy, assuming um, you know you're you know, up to, your, assuming it's not over your policy limits, but you should still be eligible for the full replacement cost, regardless of whether you. But you have to replace as long as you replace on your location or another location, you're eligible for that full replacement cost. You know that's, so that's relatively new, and make sure you understand that option. I mean, you don't have to rebuild in your existing location. I mean, separate from what the PG&E is offering you, maybe some additional options that you should seriously consider just so you understand all your options. But the California law says that if your house you know, burns down, then you can take that replacement cost value of your policy and go build someplace else. Or go buy an existing house that's already built someplace else you know, up to the policy limits. You got lots of options. Make sure you think through all the options. That makes most sense for you. Uh, let's see, so while you're looking at those questions, what I can do is, the, the people from the Department of Insurance, can you introduce yourself so that people know uh, who you are and, and that way, in case they want to ask you a question afterwards, go ahead, st introduce yourselves in the back there. So feel free to uh, talk to any of these folks um, afterwards if you'd like, or come up to talk to any people up here on the panel. Any people from PG&E, city officials, insurance company folks, we'll all be sticking around here for, uh, for a period of time after we wind up here. Any, any other questions from the audience? Yes, ma'am, you can come on up and then Tony will be getting to some of these written questions here in a moment. So. Milan, um, I live on 2781 Concord Way. You know, I just want to uh, say my house had very serious small damage, and then uh, restoration came in and cleaned the house. And I'm wondering, you know, I, I just don't feel very safe to live in the house because I have serious uh, allergy. So I'm wondering what is my option, you know, whether can I ask the insurance company come up to come in and test the air in my house to make sure that it's safe to live in? Good, good question here. This is a common, good, very good question. Uh, can I ask who did the restoration? Do you, the insurance company contractor or the PG&E contractor? Uh, insurance company. Okay. So they came in and then they, and then they said everything's fine? At, and they well, they clean it out, clean you know, it up. and they say it's fine. But I, I'm just because the house have really very, very serious uh, smoke damage, you know, and we still haven't moved in yet because it's still going through some uh, repair process until January. Well, you can certainly ask your company to come in and 
check it out. And uh -huh. in some cases, although it's, it's, it could be an expense, a considerable expense, an insurance company can send out a hygienist to um, really do a, a, some testing on the, on the air quality and, and that sort of thing to make sure that there isn't any uh, residual mm -hmm. uh, smoke and other issues there. Um, you're always free to do that. Obviously, that's an extra expense on your side. Um, you know, whether or not that's something that um, if the insurance company, dis you could come to us, we take a look at it and see whether the, the insurance company is willing or we can have the insurance company make a request to them to truly ascertain what the situation is. Uh -huh. um, if, it, if it's something that um, ultimately isn't done that way, uh, whether or not you know, PG&E would be willing to, to cover that, uh, you might, might be an alternative too, mm -hmm. to see if they're willing to cover the cost of a, the hygienist coming what, in. What's your insurance company? Uh, uh, State Farm. Okay, so State Farm, raise your hand. Yeah, if, if, uh, first of all, talk to the State Farm person afterwards and see uh, what their policy is about this. Uh, second of all, PG&E, uh, have you thought through this issue of what to do about people wondering about the, uh, w uh, whether it's safe to be in, in homes that had serious smoke damage? I mean, have you, is this an issue you've worked on? Yeah, I think uh, ideally we'd like them to consult with their insurance company first. And then they're always, you know, depending on how their insurance company responds, Once again, my name is Dustin Perkins with uh, PG&E's Claims Department. Uh, like I said, ideally we'd like them to pose the question to their insurance company first to see if that's something that can be covered under their policy, but they're always free to come to us, submit a claim, and, and uh, ask us to get involved at that point in time. And everybody should have uh, their claims manager's name and relationship manager's name, so that's the, that's the process on getting in touch with us. How, how do they get that? I mean, you've already delivered those? Yeah, yeah. I'm sure yeah. everybody uh, has been inundated, and I'm sure they know their name by now. So, but if, if if not, how how do they get a hold of you? Oh, my name, my number. Yeah, I mean, if, if they're if they, if they need the name of their relationship. Yeah, you can just uh, give me a call, and uh, I can provide my phone number. That's area code seven zero seven four nine five nine six seven two. Now go directly to me, and then I can I can help you and put you in touch. With right. Thank you. you. Need to. Okay. Okay, so um, uh, Milan, right? I guess so. Start with State Farm. See if they'll cover it. Uh, you fall back on PG&E. If that doesn't work, then uh, let us review your insurance policy so that we can explain to you what your legal rights are. Okay. Uh, I have a, another question. Sure. Okay. So um, our, my back is completely burned down. It's completely, you know, it's very badly damaged. So I believe my insurance, you know, uh, like a lot of trees as well. So I believe the insurance covers five hundred dollars per tree, but I do not believe I can replace the tree in my backyard with that amount. So what what can I do? Um, even I think I I don't know what is the total backyard replacement or landscape replacement. Uh, maybe I will talk to my insurance later. Yeah, I mean you you'll generally have a a landscaping limit as well as a per tree limit, mm -hmm. as you suggested, $500. Um, the, the key is to really know how much, from your end, from your point of view, how much it will cost. Mm -hmm. um, you need to get a really good uh, you know, landscaping estimate as to what it really is going to cost and have it broken out, obviously, by, by the individual parts, the trees, et cetera, so that you can then see how much of that is going to be covered by the insurance company because there is going to be some limits on landscaping and that is one of the areas that that the typical insurance policy does have uh, significant limitations on um, but once you've attained once you've obtained that estimate you'll at least know what your insurance company is going to pay and in this particular case um, I don't want to speak for PG&E obviously but there is an alternative source that you could approach similar to the other issue of once you're clear as to what the insurance company is going to pay or, or what their limitations are, um, if you think they're not paying the rightful amount, obviously come to us. But once you think that they're paying either the limit or something reasonable um, in, that, in that sense, then you can go to PG&E with that difference too and, mm -hmm. and, and see where that goes. Is that fair to say, PG&E folks, that, that uh, once the insurance policy pays to the limit for ex exterior and external damage, 
then you have a fund where you, you, you will consider making additional payments to bring property back to where it was, even if it wasn't, if the insurance policy didn't cover right. the whole thing. Yes, if, if I can, I probably need to speak on something. Please. Yeah. <laughs> probably to build on uh, Denise's um, question earlier about privacy. You know, in order for us to really work with both the our customers and the ins their insurers and to make the process seamless between under insurance and you know what's covered under their insurance policy and what they can come to PG&E for consideration. We need everybody to sign those authorization forms and um, that will allow us to speak to your insurance companies about your claim. And uh, you know, Commissioner, if we could impress upon you to you know, say that, that that is a really important part of the process going mm -hmm. forward. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for making that clear. Did you? Did you? Oh, I wanted to ask um, him if he could review adding to the question that you had previously about landscaping, because they they were offering some new program. I think ten thousand dollars for the beautification. Yeah, that's something we can take way? offline. Yeah. We talked about yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Thanks. Did, did you have any other questions? No. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Please, Tom, Tom. I just wanted to, to make sure that everybody um, understands that the governor cited in the executive order um, to help you all uh, with your important documents, the replacement of those uh, that, that are governmental documents, whether it's driver's license, birth certificates, or other types of, of uh, governmental documents. If you, if you didn't participate um, when we had the local assistance center, uh, that is still available to you. So if you haven't replaced those documents, uh, please uh, get with me and I'll, I'll uh, direct you to one of my staff members uh, so that you can get those, uh, those important documents. You may not have needed them uh, at the time, but uh, in six months from now, uh, you may certainly need those. Good point, Tom. The state of California is waiving uh, replacement costs? Correct. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Any other questions? Does that include, yeah. does that include replacement of naturalization certificate? Because I asked, that's 280 to uh, get that replaced. All, all, all we can do is replace state of California documents, whether they're birth certificates. We, we can't, we don't have um, uh, the ability to go to the federal government. So. My name is Brian Perkins. I work for Congresswoman Spear, and you can call our office and get your federal government documents replaced, and we have a couple of people that are dedicated to doing that, um, both for yourself and also for the people that will watch this on tape. Let me give you our phone number. It's 342-0300, 342-0300. We deal with the naturalization papers, the passports, and any other papers, um, the green cards, and the rest of it. So just call, and uh, we have Jonathan and Mark who are in charge of those things. Okay. What's the area code? 650 area code. We're down San Mateo. Very good. Very nice. Thank you. Maybe I could give the phone number for everybody that needs yeah. any state documents. Uh, the area code is 916-845-8510. That's 916-845-845. Uh, 8510. And you want to ask for Karma, K A R M A, and the last name is Hackney, H A C K N E Y. She's in charge of my uh, interview little assistance. She'll be able to help you. If you lose track of any of these numbers, just call our hotline. We'll get you to these, to, to these folks who we one work other, with all the time. And right. one other point someone asked if there's any charge for the federal government documents. Unfortunately, there is a charge. But we've been told that you're supposed to turn that into PG&E so that PG&E can reimburse you for that. Is that right? So PG&E will pay right? for the cost yeah. of... So there is a good. charge, but you get reimbursed by PG&E. Also, Brian, while you're up there, what's going on tomorrow night? Thank you. Tomorrow night there's going to be a town hall co-hosted by the um, City of San Bruno and Congresswoman Spear, and we're going to be giving an update from the National Transportation Safety Board and also from another, a number of other governmental agencies. And we'll be responding to a lot of these questions as well, probably for a somewhat larger audience. And uh, we'll also be talking about moving the pipe, and it is going to get moved, as I think you know. So The location um, and the time? Location is St. Robert's uh, Church, and it'll be from 6.30 until 8.30, and until whatever time is necessary that the church will allow us after that. Thanks, Brian. Thank you.
Any other questions? We're going to get to these. Written. Yes, do you have a question? The context. The go, go ahead. And, so, so they can get you on film. Go ahead and get up there. If you have a question, maybe you can move your way towards the microphone, and we'll we'll try to get through these. Quickly. I'm Anita Madrigal. I'm actually a good friend of uh, Maria Tavar, who lost her home in San Bruno. So I'm her right-hand woman right now, helping her with the little tidbits. But one of the things that came up was uh, her daughter on the ninth uh, was going to go to a concert, and she had her and her, t uh, her friend's tickets in her car. I'm having a difficult time with Ticketmaster to get that $300 reimbursed. Is that an insurance matter? Or is it Ticketmaster? It's, it's, you know, I mean, my first That's the first time I've ever heard a question like this. Uh, good question, though. Yes. Well, I would say you know the best bet is to get everybody involved. I mean, whether that's whether that would come under your personal property for one or the other's homeowners coverage, whether there's some uh, small coverage in there on on, a, on an auto policy for personal property that might have been, you know, in a vehicle. Um, but certainly pursue Ticketmaster and any other searches you have. But it's, it's definitely worth looking at. Amy, are you familiar with this question of, of uh, personal property like tickets that burn up in a car? Have you come across that? You know, I, the tricky one there is Yep. But as long as I'm talking, I have a question. Yep. Uh, <laughs> okay. um, actually, this relates to your request that people sign the consent form for PG&E to talk to their insurance company. Um, and I think a lot of people have a concern about the, how broad that is and why you need that. Um, so I would love to know why you can't just accept if uh, people give you their policy or their deck page, then you can see what their limits are, you can see what their deductible is, and then you can ask them to, to tell you how much they've gotten from their insurance company. Uh, it seems that shouldn't that, is, can that suffice instead of them giving the broad cons consent? Because I, I think people do have a very legitimate f feeling that I don't necessarily want PG&E and my insurance company kind of ganging up on me and it just, doesn't feel right. Yeah, and in the case where the authorization really comes into play is in the event where you have your you're underinsured and you submit a claim to PG&E to make up the difference of what you're uh, underinsured for. And like I said, to make the process as seamless as possible, so we can, rather than sit back and wait six to eight months for the insurance company to submit their subrogation claim to us, we can get out in front of that and say, you know what, if you allow us to speak to them now, they can provide us the information about your claim now so we can handle the claim in a more timely manner. Um, otherwise, we really can't do much. We have to sit and wait for their claim to come in. So that, that's really the, the need for the authorization. Well, I mean, if the person tells you, I've gotten paid, X and I need Y, then you can Well, yeah, if, if they can provide us with a detailed statement of loss from their insurance company or the settlement documents from their insurance company and a deck page, that could probably suffice. Okay. We could probably work with that. Mm -hmm. um, but in the event that, uh, that they can't provide that, you know, it, might be, it might be best Understood. to. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Thanks for asking that, Amy. Anybody else? Please. Uh, my name is Terry Albertoli, and we lost our house on Concord Way. And I was just wondering, like property tax wise, say that we, when you were saying that you're not committed to build in the same place and you decide to build somewhere else, I mean, say that we build in the same place, are, is our property going to be reassessed um, again and our property tax is going to go up because all of a sudden our property is worth more? Or if we decide that we want to buy a new house, then all of a sudden we're going to be stuck paying higher property taxes because. It does Brian, do you? Uh, see, it looks like Brian has researched this one. <laughs> <laughs> do you, yeah. 
you know, so in, in this case I'm not actually going to offer the answer I'm going to offer the phone number because tomorrow night the assessor's office will also be at this meeting and they can answer questions like that but for those of you that can't make it tomorrow night or if you want to just call tomorrow <coughs> the phone number for the assessor except for the fact that I need my reading glasses is um, 650-599-1291 650-599-1291 and so you just give Joel Morris, who's the man who's at that phone number, Joel Morris, you give him your fact pattern and ask him and he'll give you an answer. Because it's really a lot of these questions based upon the facts and the case and, and you really need to get it specified. Thank you. Tony, and if you, you also add? come tomorrow night, you can see the man himself. <laughs> Good. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add that, um, you know, in, in past uh, like wildfire events and, and other disaster uh, related events, um, there has been a si situations where the the homeowner was able to keep their their tax basis um, in the rebuilt home, or in some cases in a replacement home. Um, I, I don't know the law enough. Obviously, it's a question as, as Mr. Perkins suggested that you might want to ask specifically with your case with the assessor. But I think there is uh, something in place at uh, either the state level or, or, or county or, or local levels that might, that might provide some uh, benefit there. I just wanted to add to Brian's comments that uh, if you're not able to make it tomorrow night, that meeting will also be videotaped uh, by San Bruno Cable Television and will be replayed on Channel 1 at a later time. Unfortunately, it will not be able to be telecast live because we're holding a meeting at St. Robert's Church. If you are not uh, able to view it on uh, Channel 1 and you would like to see the whole of the meeting uh, and you're not able to be there, if you uh, give the city manager's office a call at 616-7056, uh, we can arrange for you to get a, a disc of the, of the video and you can play it at, at your leisure. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Please. Hi, my name is Liz Chu, and uh, I'm the owner, and uh, I have a house in uh, Claremont Drive, and I'm renting it to a, uh, to a tenant when the fire explosion happening, and then the, my tenant decides not to come back, and then they rent another house. So right now, my house was only three houses from the last house, Ground Zero, and the cross street from my house is also ground zero. So my roof is have uh, some damage. I call State Farm, my insurance, and I did with them for more than 30 years. And they sent someone come over to look at my roof. And then they said the damage is about 4,000 or something and $1,000 deductible. They sent me a check for 3,000 to repair the roof. So I called the PG&E, and then they sent the insurance people to come over, and then the PG&E insurance person went up to my roof, and then he said, this roof has to be replaced. It's not repairable because it's a double layer. So they said, uh, talk to State Farm. So, but they already sent me the check in October 15. I already cast the check. Is it too late for me to go back to State Farm, say this roof is not repairable, it has to be replaced? Is it too late? What can we do to help? Well, I mean, it shouldn't be too late. I mean, obviously, um, you, you need to get back with your insurance company. They need to get either back out to inspect it, and you may need to get uh, a, your, a, a contractor to provide an estimate of what it would cost to repair the damage if, if, if in fact it needs to be fully replaced, the cost to fully replace the roof. Um, at that point, the insurance company needs to consider that estimate and make a decision on it. Um, if they ultimately pay it, great. If they ultimately uh, don't pay it, and you know, we would want to make sure that they were fulfilling their obligations. If there's a difference there that um, you think you want to you know, talk to PG&E about, you certainly should do that. But I would say it's not over. You know, definitely get the process going again and uh, get some information and get the insurance company back on it. And the second question is, um, since my rental moved out 
and I lost the rent income, and um, I gave my tenant some uh, security deposit <coughs> and 22 days of rent we pay from September. And I have uh, a chat and I have a letter from my tenant that they move out and I send it to State Farm Insurance. Right now I'm losing the rent income and so they send me the rent to, I have a uh, rental insurance and they should, send, they should send me the rent every month because right now it's still empty. And I call State Farm <coughs> and then they said, we are waiting for the report from the adjuster. So the adjuster is already went to my house and no, it's already empty. So how come I'm still waiting for the rent income to come back to me? Well, I mean, certainly let's get you hooked up with State Farm tonight, but I mean, if you have a, if you have a landlord's policy and you, you're eligible for loss of rents uh, coverage, then you should be getting it and you should be getting it in a timely fashion. So obviously let's take a look at it. Let's get with State Farm and let's figure it out. So. Yeah, it's already almost two months. Okay, State Farm person, uh, you think you can help? Okay, so can you make sure to see him tonight? Okay. And let us know how the conversation goes. Okay, thank you. What else? Any other questions, sir, please? Good evening. My name is uh, Mike Zapata. I live up on 1791 Earl, and um, I have quite a bit of issues with uh, State Farm. Basically, uh, they haven't done anything that they've said they were going to do up to this date. We don't even have a start date on when uh, any of the work is to be done. Um, we get the runaround. Uh, constantly um, we have to stay on the phone and call them they do not call us back unless we call them um, we are we do have a new adjuster at this time that we we are working with with State Farm but um, uh, so hopefully this is going to get resolved now but we're at two we're almost two months past the date of the explosion um, the way I see it is I have a 15 year old daughter at home and she was home the day of the explosion and a lot of these other people were home too. And to uh, have to deal with the day to day thought of that explosion, um, that's bad enough. They're trying to get the insurance companies just to do their due diligence and maybe even PG&E. But uh, what is their obligation on when do they have to start the work and end. We leave our house in the morning and we hear hammering and saws and people's roofs are getting fixed and people's property are being painted, but yet ours, nothing. But we keep getting phone calls. We, get, we have to call them. And the story we get is, oh, um, we're gonna have to send this person out. And we've had all our inspections. We've had home inspectors, structural engineers, chimney inspectors, um, roof inspectors. And uh, just today, we had another structural engineer come out from State Farm. Um, it is tiring. It is, it's, a, it's a whole bag of mixed, mixed emotions. If it wasn't for uh, city officials from San Bruno, Brian Perkins helping us, um, we don't know where we'd be right now. So if you could just kind of give us an, an, um, a deadline on when are they supposed to at least get the work started, we can't get a straight answer. They say it's their contractor. The contractor says it's State Farm. Do you have any idea? Well, I mean, th I mean, thanks to to Mr. Perkins um, providing you know your information to us. We were you know certainly the last few months it, it appears as though that you know things weren't on track, and obviously we hope that they are are close to being on track now. Um, we've had several you know we've had several conversations a couple conversations with you. Um, from someone from my staff, as well as uh, Leon Tiffany, I think uh, spoke. To yes, you. right. S spoke to her this and, morning. Right, and um, we're hopefully. I mean, I think that we're going to get that on track. Um, that's why you know you're the only one that's come to us, and you came to us through the congresswoman's office, and that's why I really urge others that that do have these situations to not wait, because um, once you have a problem. It's not too late, but it causes this additional time before we could get involved and perhaps intercede and get, get the case back on track. In terms of what the time frame is, you know, the, the bottom line answer is that the contractor is yours. 
you know, you're the one that signs the authorization to get the work done. It's, it's confused by the insurance process. The insurer has to come in, inspect it, quantify the damages. In many cases, they'll make a referral of a contractor to you, which you then sign up with and have the work done by them. One of the issues that you have in your particular case and which will occur in, in several situations is the dispute as to what you or your contractors may feel is the proper amount of damages, for example, whether your roof needs to be replaced or just repaired um, versus what the insurance company's opinion is on that. Um, so until that gets resolved, that does slow down the process of repairs, but hopefully we're back on track on your case um, and you know, we're, we're gonna be continuously looking at that to make sure that the insurance company's back on track, getting, getting back to you timely with their contractors. And if you're gonna use one of their contractors, um, you know, that's one issue. You also have a right to use your own contractor too. Well, that's what we went with. We went with their preferred contractors for the one, one reason is that uh, they take all the responsibilities of contracting everything, subcontract, subcontracting everything out. So I thought that would be less of a headache. To, you know, we don't need any more headaches at this time. But it didn't. Uh, it appears at this time it doesn't seem to be going that way. We hope that is changing course. We hope, and we do have um, um, a slight feeling that it, it it is. But until it actually does turn right. that corner, we are still on the you know on the what ifs. Right, and we'll and we'll be on top of it to make sure that it stays on course. Have we been in, now that we've gotten the complaint here? Have we got been in touch with State Farm? Yeah, it was several times, and we we've been working with them, right. and they and they they assign a new adjuster. And uh, right. your name is Mike, right? Yes. Uh, State Farm folks, it seems incredibly slow here. Can you help uh, talk to? I mean, so you're um, from the claim side of State Farm. Uh, Who, who, who are the State Farm? Okay. Oh, you got a whole bunch of people here. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad. You've got some customers here that need your help. So, can, can you, um, in addition to what you've already done, uh, and talk to these folks tonight too? Absolutely. And then can you report back to Tony and let, let, let us know Absolutely. if you're getting some movement? Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for asking. Yeah. yeah I, I just want to take off on what Mike said. Um, I, I just got a briefing from the National Weather Service the other day. There, there's a couple of things that, that I would hope that, that you would remember, um, and, and hopefully the insurance folks will, will hear this out. We're starting to get into the rain period now, um, and, and certainly um, last year was a heavy rain um, time for us, uh, but it looks like we're gonna get significant rain. Uh, I would ask that, that if you have any problems just like Mike just spoke about with your roofs and everything else. You really need to get with those insurance companies because there's not a whole lot of time left to be able to do roof repairs and erosion control and other things. Um, so with that said, the commissioner has been doing this for two and a half years and I've seen firsthand uh, the fruition uh, of these types of meetings where folks get up and speak and they speak and other folks um, who are listening say, gee, I have that same problem, or gee, I, 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 I think I'm getting to that period where it's gone from two weeks now to four weeks to six weeks. Um, so th this is a, a perfect venue, uh, even if you're shy, to get up and speak so that someone else might have the same issue that you're having um, that can get resolved and can get resolved tonight with the insurance companies here. It's been very fruitful for the two and a half years I've been working with the commissioner and his staff. So please uh, voice some of your issues and understand that you know you don't have summer any longer. You, you've got the weather coming uh, about and uh, time is of the essence. Yeah, good points, Tom. Brian, you were gonna Commissioner, add? can I just use Mr. Zapata's example for a broader point? Sure. Um, roofs, roofs are a particular problem in this case and I don't know how many more there will be but an insurance company's typical obligation in a roofing situation is probably different uh, than the legal obligation of PG&E. And what we have in Mr. Zapata's case and others is an instance of dueling experts. And it's very frustrating. I'm sure there's other examples too here of dueling experts. And he went out and he got a structural engineer and then another uh, you know, roofer comes by and says, oh no, you can repair it, but of course I won't guarantee it if I repair it. You know, if it leaks, it leaks. That's hardly a roofing job. And so, 
I guess what I would suggest is I think the Department of Insurance and PG&E in particular need to work hand in hand to figure out the legal, you know, where the insurance company's obligation starts, stops, excuse me, where PG&E's can pick up the difference and how you get it resolved quickly. Because it's not that big a deal. I'm not a roofer. I have actually roofed three homes in my life. And I can tell what is going on with Mr. Zapata's roof. And I think personally that Mr. Zapata's owed a new roof. And I think that ultimately if PG&E were to take a look at that, they would probably agree. Because the question boils down to one of, gee, what does a roof look like after it's had a blast from a natural gas line? And the answer is probably no one on earth can say. Therefore, PG&E is probably going to have a liability here, and they need to step in because the insurance company is probably not going to acknowledge that very easily. They're going to see a depreciated roof. They're going to be seeing something that's got some value. So I would appreciate it if the legal department of the Department of Insurance would work with the legal department at PG&E to make these kinds of situations, particularly in cases of depreciation, as seamless as possible. This didn't have to go on as long as it did. It's very frustrating when you have dueling experts. Yes, thank you. We, we will look into that. Good. Okay, very good. Anything else? Any other questions? Okay, uh, yeah. Do you have some, uh, also, Tony, do you have some unique questions here? That, yes. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, my boss just uh, told me, he said that uh, if you make a claim to your insurance company, will my premium go up next year and the next time? And I told her, I told him, it's not my fault. So my question is, because I make a claim to my insurance company, will the premium goes up in the future? That's my question. Uh, you know, in, in general, it, it should not um, go up, especially in situations like this. Mm -hmm. um, we would have to look at the specific company, the specific rate plan that, you, that you're under, that would you be under now or the, or the, the person's under, um, and, and evaluate whether um, it would go up. It would certainly go up if you replaced and you needed more coverage, and so you'd be paying for more coverage. If you, were, if you have a total loss and you had a $300,000 home and you built a $400,000 home and now you need $400,000 worth of coverage, your premium would go up, um, but that would be because you have a bigger house or more expensive house now. In terms of just merely uh, your, because you had a claim, uh, your premium going up, it would really be on a company-by-company -company basis. We have to look at it. The only way I really see that happening is if, let's say, you had a claims-free discount, and, and then you file the claim, and then that discount might may be removed. But all of this has to be on record with the Department of Insurance, you know, approved by, by the commissioner's office uh, as, a, as a rate filing. And so, you know, we, we could take a look at any particular case, any particular company, and provide a more specific um, idea to, to you or anyone else. Insurance policies already include uh, the likelihood there may be some disasters and wildfires, and so the, the price you already pay includes the possibility for this. And so uh, the, the insurance companies, you know, aren't going to receive permission to raise prices just because there's a, you know, of, of, of some some claims I mean, that's already built into the pricing structure that we oversee. But how about, is there any, thank you very much. Is there any uh, questions that we've gotten in writing that are, haven't been covered yet by, by speakers? And then, then we'll wrap up here in a second and, and, and uh, adjourn formally, but then if you have additional questions, you know, we'll stay afterwards. Go ahead, Tony. Okay, let me see what I can do here. Um, this question is, if remodeling due to some damage, what is, an, what is a realistic time frame expectation that I can have for my insurance company to complete this by? One month, two months, three months? And the example given is the remodel of a bathroom. Um, you know, and let me just, so let me go through a, a kind of the scenario here. Um, again, you need to be clear that the contractor that comes into your home is your contractor. Whether the insurance company referred that contractor to you or, or whether you hired your own contractor. And so, you need to be clear with that. There may, it may create obligations on the insurance company if they referred the contract to you. In other words, if they referred the contractor to you and you use that contractor, you know, the, the insurance company then has to warrant the work that's, you know, warrant that the work's done in a workmanlike manner, uh, et cetera. And so there, in a theory, there's that additional protection there 
Um, but you're not obligated, you know, first off, you're not obligated to use the insurance company recommended contractor. You, you can go off and get your own contractor, make sure they're licensed, uh, make sure they have both workers' comp and liability insurance, and get a, another es get an estimate. You're comfortable with the estimate, and get the work done by them. If, if you want to get an estimate just to feel comfortable in terms of what the price is, and then still go with the insurance company contractor um, once you come to an agreement with the insurance company on that price, go ahead and do that. Um, but so in, in the, so in other words, the answer to the question of timing is really, it's your contractor and, and therefore your contractor should be doing it as quickly as possible. Again, with the insurance company inserted into this process a little bit, the issue is not so much can the insurance company's contractor do the work in that period of time, it's really is that contractor uh, uh, going to do it for the price and do the full job that you're expecting be done? And until that part's ironed out, that's gonna create a delay. And so that part needs to be resolved and that could be where some of these delays are occurring rather than just a contractor either being too busy or not showing up, uh, which could happen also. And, it, and if that's the case, and if it's an insurance company referred contractor, you should immediately get with that insurance company and get them to get the contractor to move faster um, or you need to get another contractor. Um, I'll, I'll bring up one last point uh, in terms of contractors and uh, repair estimates. You need to, the price is going to be key whether you use one, your contractor or the other contractor. If, if the insurance company comes up with a, a price to repair your home and you're comfortable with it, fine, go with it. If you're not comfortable with it and you get a, a contractor estimate, the insurance company is obligated to consider that estimate. Once you've turned that estimate over to the insurance company, it triggers three options. They either have to pay the higher estimate, they either have to refer you to a contractor to do it for their lower estimate, but only if you request the name of another contractor, or they have to reasonably adjust your estimate. Um, you know, it, the key is what does reasonably adjust mean? That's something we could assist with in terms of um, whether the insurance company is properly evaluating uh, any reductions that it does place on your contractor's estimate. But until you've provided that alternate estimate, that higher estimate, it, it will delay uh, ultimately, uh, you know, number one, your, your comfort that you're getting the right money and uh, commitment from the insurance company to pay either your contractor or their contractor to do the full scope of work. Any other written questions? Uh, the other one we somewhat touched on, but it, it, it involves uh, the issue of the owner of the property versus a rental property. Um, and then the owner, in this case, the owner was feeling that they weren't inserted into the process or weren't provided the information that the renter was being provided. Um, I, without more specifics, it's really, it's hard to answer that question, but the owner of the property should certainly be involved with their insurance company you know, and or, uh, you know, separately with PG&E on their own terms for their own situation and for their own financial loss that they've suffered as well as the renter and the tenant should be in, if they have renter's insurance or if they don't have renter's insurance, uh, working with PG&E or others, um, and in some cases maybe even, you know, SBA, uh, you know, in certain situations if, if that gets put into place for, for their own financial uh, loss that they suffered. And so there, should be, there shouldn't be a situation where uh, either PG&E or an insurance company is not talking to the owner of the property, especially if it's the owner's insurance company. So uh, without more specifics, I can't really answer that question, but we would be happy to look into it if someone wanted to provide that information. And the, the other question was um, a personal contents list. Is there a time limit by when uh, it needs to get started and, and, and uh, completed? Uh, you know, it's, there's no real answer to that. The, the, you know, the answer is, we certainly understand at the beginning of this, you know, no one's at the right mindset to enter into this, this process. Um, but get started as quickly as you can, save your receipts, use your insurance company to assist you to as much as you're comfortable with that. Use the uh, consumer groups um, that have the ability to assist with, you know, they have computer programs and inventories that could assist you in kind of giving you an idea of what you might have had in your home, you know, group lists of various items that are in the general home that you can check and kind of, you know, refresh your memory and that sort of thing. Um, in terms of the ultimate time period, you know, your policy will dictate that, 
but you, you know, you're generally going to have about a year. Um, if you're rebuilding completely, you're going to have longer than that. Um, and if there's an issue with the insurance company as you approach that time period of time, then, then you know, let us know and we can work with the insurance company on that. <coughs> okay, thanks, Tony. I any other final questions? Are, are all, right. all the insurance companies represented here today? No, no just the, 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 what, five or six or so that, that spoke up. Yeah, can you repeat? Uh, what, yeah, so, so the insurance companies that are here, can you just identify the name? AAA of Northern California. AAA, uh, State. All State. State Farm. State Farm. Travelers. Safeco. Safeco. Farmers. Farmers. Travelers. Travelers. Any others? But if your insurance company is not here and, and you have questions or, or issues, come to us You know, as soon as we wrap up. and. Give us your information. Give us the name of your insurance company. We'll be happy to follow up with them on any questions or issues that you have, sir. Yep. Was there somebody over here that had a question? Yes, sir. Yeah, one thing I wanted to mention. My name is uh, Jack Capello. I'm with uh, Capello Drink. Um, I'm somewhat familiar with the process. We've dealt with it somewhat. And uh, I would recommend anybody just to get um, outside of the preferred service preferred list for the insurance companies, for the contractors. Um, I, I recommend anybody get an actual uh, bid from multiple contractors outside of that, specifically because they use, um, you mentioned earlier about the Xactimate. Um, it, not that Xactimate's not accurate, I mean, it, it's, it is an estimating program, um, but uh, sometimes it is a little unrealistic on, on certain things. I have seen the numbers um, that, that, it's, uh, that it's spit out of the system, and, and uh, it, you know, it is black and white numbers, but it, you know, you look at some of the hours for certain things, and, and uh, you know, it is unfortunate what happened, but don't let people glue your house back together. You know, just make sure it's done right. So, that's it. Good point. Uh, thank you all very much for coming. I hope this has been helpful. I hope we can help you in the future. Thank you all very much for coming out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.